very first service and we had our people setting up and then lo and behold, all of a sudden there's Dave Hines and he's helping us tear down. For five and a half years, he helped us load the truck when we had the truck, drive the truck when we needed to drive the truck to whatever location we were meeting in, unload the truck, all that kind of stuff. Eventually in 2010, we appointed him to be one of the elders in our church. And as I began to know him more and more over the years, I remember I had conversation after conversation with him about biblical things. And you know what? Never once did I ever bring up anything from the Bible that was new to him, that was unfamiliar to him. In all of our conversations, he was always up to speed. And in fact, one day we were talking and he brought up something that I had to say, I don't know that. We looked it up in a Bible. I later preached on that passage and I was like, that dude told me about it and I hadn't even realized it before. He knew stuff even that I didn't know and everything I ever mentioned to him, he already knew. And so I asked him one time this last year, I was like, Dave, you weren't raised in the church. You didn't go to any kind of college. Tell me how you got the knowledge that you have. What kind of discipleship program did you go through? What kind of educational system did you go through? Tell me how you got it, because I want to help other people get that too. And with all sincerity in his face, he looked at me and said, I read my Bible. And I realized there's a huge difference between people who expect others to feed them and people who feed themselves. A massive difference. And so I see this problem as a root problem of, of all the stuff that we get ourselves into when it comes to churches and Christianity and, and the weirdness that we get ourselves into. Let me take you to Hebrews chapter 5 where the writer of Hebrews addresses this very issue. And we don't really know who wrote Hebrews. Some people think Paul wrote it, but it's different from the other letters that he wrote, and so we don't have a certainty that it's Paul's writing. But we do know this. The writer of Hebrews was deeply connected to the supremacy of Jesus above all other things, and he wanted his brother and sister Jewish people to know it too. He was committed to it. And so when we get to chapter 5, he's just finished talking about how Jesus is above all other things. Jesus is more important than all these other things. He is the supreme fulfillment of everything the Old Testament was talking about. And so we get to chapter 5, and he says this, We have much to say about this. In other words, all this stuff about Jesus being the best. We have a lot to say about this. But it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. The old NIV version, the 1984 NIV version translates that, you are slow to learn. And the word slow there literally means lazy or slothful. So when it says you are slothful to learn, you are lazy to learn, that's why this new version translates it, you no longer try to understand. Verse 12, in fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil, trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instruction about cleansing rites, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment, and God permitting, we will do so. And his point there is, I want to move beyond these elementary things. Next week, we're going to talk about the difference between the milk, the elementary things, and the solid food and what that really is. But today, I just want to grasp this idea that the guy who wrote Hebrews is like, we need to move beyond the elementary stuff. We need to move beyond the milk. We need to get to solid food. Move beyond the bottle. Get to the fork. But before we get to the fork... In fact, next week is what we're actually talking about, the solid food stuff. So the fork today for you is just a teaser. 
take it home, put it somewhere, use it as a bookmark in your Bible or something and be like, hey, I need to remember, I need to do some eating. And next week I'm going to find out a little bit more about what the eating really is all about. But, but for now, just hang on to it as a teaser for next week. I want to draw your attention to this passage where the writer identifies two contrasting ideas. He says there are two kinds of people. He says there are teachers and there are infants. Now, this is fascinating to us because we all want to be middle of that. We all want to be the adolescent young adult. We all want to be the, the carefree person who's just living life without the huge amount of responsibilities. If you went to college, you think back to college and you're like, that was awesome, man. I loved college. It was so great. I was carefree, whatever. If you never went to college, you're thinking about just retirement and, you know, I can't wait until I just get done with this thing and I can go on, do whatever and be free and, and all that stuff. We like to be in the middle of this. We don't want to be the teacher with the responsibilities of teachers. And we also don't want to think of ourselves as infants. But look at what this guy says. He says, you ought to be teachers, but you're not your infants. There's no middle of the road there. What does that mean? Well, if I were to make it sort of understandable to our modern sensibilities, I could say it this way. I think this is possibly the idea that we should hold. It's that in every aspect of our lives, you either know it, so you should teach it, or you don't know it, so you need to learn it. And you don't have as a whole persona, infant or teacher, as your whole persona. There's no one who knows everything and who can be a teacher about everything. But in every separate component of your life, you either know it or you don't. And if you know it, you should be a teacher. And if you don't know it, admit you're an infant. Does that make sense? I think that's kind of what he's saying, that there's this, there's this piece of each of us that's partially there. And when it comes to the spiritual life, these people have been Christians for so long that the writer says, you should be teachers by now. Don't you know this stuff? Obviously you don't. I got to teach it to you all over again. Two kinds of people, teachers and infants. Now, I know that you think about yourself and I think about myself and I identify the different components of who I am. And in this part, I'm a teacher. And in that part, I'm an infant. And the danger is when I mix the two of them. I'll show you in just a minute how that's dangerous. But before we get there, notice there are two kinds of food in this passage also. There are two kinds of people, two kinds of food. There's milk and there's solid food. In this passage, there's milk and there's solid food. Next week, as I said, we're going to talk about the difference. But today, I just want to highlight this one piece. Milk is what is given to you. Solid food is what you eat yourself. Milk is delivered in a bottle. Solid food is eaten with a fork. Milk is something a baby gets. Solid food, you have to be mature enough to eat. So if you guys are, are willing, I'm going to go on just a little bit of a rant here. Okay. There's a phrase that I have heard a lot. It's a phrase, since my dad was a pastor, it's a phrase I heard first when um, a man in that church decided he wanted to leave the church in such a way that got other people to leave the church too. He sent a letter to every single member of the church because he had a membership directory. And so he, he hand wrote a letter or typed it or whatever, but he sent a letter to every single registered member of the church. And in that letter, he said that he was leaving the church and that everybody else should leave the church too. And the reason he was leaving the church was that my dad's messages weren't feeding him anymore. And so the phrase is, I'm not getting fed. And I got to tell you something, as a pastor myself and being in churches for a long time, I have heard that phrase 
so many times, and I'm telling you, it makes me sick. Some of you might have said that phrase before. If you've said that phrase before, I forgive you, just don't do it again. If you've never said that phrase before, someday you're going to be tempted to say this phrase once you figure out what it means, and then I'm going to, I'm going to be like, yeah, that's wrong. Don't do that. But here's the deal. This, the phrase itself communicates something. What it means for most people is that I went to church. I didn't get anything out of it. I went home just the same as I was when I got there. Therefore, they didn't feed me. Therefore, I'm not getting fed. Therefore, it's their fault. I need to find another church. That's the gist of this. Now, at the heart of it, there's a, there's a desire to, to have real solid food, and that's a good thing. But on the surface of it, just for most people, what that means is I'm not getting fed from someone else. And I have to ask you this question. Who needs to be fed? Babies. See, babies are the ones who get fed, right? Babies are the ones who get fed. You put the milk in a bottle. They don't know they need milk. They don't know that. All they know is they need something. They don't know what it is. But you just put, you, you're the dad, you're the mom, you put the milk in the bottle, you shove it into their face, and if they don't want to take it, you just hold it there until they finally eat it. And then you cajole them and you, you pinch their cheeks or whatever to get them to suck on it. You know, there's all kinds of techniques to get babies to eat, but you want to make sure that baby eats, okay? That's how babies eat. Babies are fed. Here comes the airplane. <laughs> babies are fed, Okay. Now, who says these words? Continuing with the food metaphor. Whoever says the words, I need to be fed? Does a baby say it? No, they can't talk. They don't even know what they need. They just know they need something, and something needs to be given to them. So who says it? Does a teenage boy say those words? No, he just goes to the fridge and takes whatever he wants. He he goes to the fridge, he takes whatever he wants, pulls it out, and then the mom says, I need to be fed. No, so (laughs) no one says that if they're able to get their own food. No one says, I need to be fed. The only people who ever say that phrase or something similar to it are toddlers. Toddlers, because see, a toddler knows he's hungry and thinks he knows what will satisfy him. And then the toddler expects it to be given to him. So the toddler says, Mom, I'm starving. And the mom says, you have a plate full of green beans. And the toddler says, I don't want the green beans. You're not feeding me is what they tell their friends. My mom never gives me anything good to eat. She can't cook. She makes nasty things. (laughs) I want a different mom. (laughs) Toddlers look for someone else to feed them. Toddlers think they know what they need. And if what they get doesn't match with what they think they need, they'll move on if they can. So, if you are a baby, I'm not saying that's wrong. If you are an infant, let me just tell you, you don't know what you need. You don't know what's good food. And so all I can tell you is soak in as much as you can. Be part of the church. 